Check one, two, check one, two. Are we live? It looks like we're live. It appears so. It says we are. Yes, we are live once again. Hello, dear listeners, and welcome to another exciting episode of Storytime brought to you by me, your host, Brett Picorni. Welcome to a night filled with wonder, excitement, adventure, and all sorts of good Fun. Now, uh, just to introduce you, we are continuing with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or as it's known across the pond as Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Um, but yes, we are continuing with it from Chapter 3, where we left off last night. Now, before we get on, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this shirt I'm wearing. Uh, I'm excited because I got it today. It came in the mail. I've been waiting for it for a while. And uh, it's rather fun if you're a Rick and Morty fan and also a John Wick fan. They sort of mixed the two. So what we have here is called John Rick. Yes, there we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Don't worry. I'm not flashing you. Just showing you the shirt. Yes, see, John Rigg, I got, you got to love it, you got to love it, at least I do, I f found it quite amusing and I'm happy to be able to wear it tonight. Anyway, we will be picking up, like I said, tonight with Storytime, uh, tonight's episode, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, uh, chapter three is where we're picking up, I may have mistyped in the, uh, in the description, I think I said uh, chapter two, and I meant chapter three, regardless, you know where we are, if you need to pick up uh, if you need to start from where we left off last night or where we started last night to catch up, uh, later on I will be posting a link to the YouTube page where you can watch all of the Storytime episodes from here on out. And uh, it will include last night's uh, episode. Uh, or you can go onto my personal profile where you can see I posted it as well. Um, but yes, all of these are available on my Facebook and they're soon to be available as well on YouTube. A uh, lot of fun. I enjoy it and I hope you do too. So I'm sending some invites so we can get some more uh, listeners slash viewers on Facebook and then we will move on to the reading. Um, so anyway, yes, we, we pick up tonight on chapter three. Uh, just a reminder, Monday through Friday, today being Friday, the last day of the week, we will be reading Harry Potter. Monday through Friday, we read our novel of the evening, uh, and uh, Harry Potter is the current one. Uh, Saturday and Sunday are reserved for fairy tales. So tomorrow and Sunday, I will be reading some Russian fairy tales for all of you, and I hope you'll enjoy those. I guarantee you, unless you've read Russian fairy tales, you've heard nothing like them ever before. They are quite amusing uh, and very interesting. Some of them quite strange. A lot of them have similar themes, uh, themes, not themes, uh, similar themes, uh, but they're all very interesting. Some of them are the same fairy tale told multiple ways, and each way different just enough that they are very much their own. So without further ado, I should get on with this reading. That way, uh, those six of you who are currently watching will not be bored to tears while I continue to talk your ears off. So here we are. Uh, let us uh, resume with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer of Stone. I've got one more page of invites I'm doing and then moving on to the reading. And I'll continue to invite throughout the reading just a bit slower than I am doing it right now. It's quite a long list of people I'm inviting, just everyone that Facebook allows me to, uh, to invite. So um, that's, a, that's a fair amount. I've got a lot of uh, Facebook friends here. So... And no, that's not me trying to be braggadocious or anything like that. Just just saying. But yes, uh, don't forget as well to share this live viewing so that your friends can watch and uh, to, uh, to comment if you like it uh, or if you have any requests or anything like that. So now moving on, as I said, I don't want you to be bored to tears. I now have, it looks like, eight current live listeners slash watchers. So we shall get a move on. Here we are with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, chapter three, the letters from no one. And uh, I will be reading two chapters tonight, just as usual. The letters from no one. The escape of the Brazilian boa constrictor earned Harry his longest ever punishment. By the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started and Dudley had already broken his new video camera crashed his remote control airplane and, first time out of his racing bike, 
knocked down old Mrs. Fig as she crossed Privet Drive on her crutches. Do do do. Harry was glad school was over, but there were no escaping the Dudley's gang. Who uh, there was no escaping Dudley's gang, who visited the house every single day. Piers, Dennis, Malcolm, and Gordon were all big and stupid, but as Dudley was the biggest and stupidest, stupidest of the lot, he was the leader. The rest of them were all quite happy to join Dudley's favorite sport, Harry hunting. Why, uh, this was why Harry spent must, uh, much of his time, as much of his time as possible, out of the house, wandering around and thinking about the end of the holidays, where he could see a tiny ray of hope. When September came, he would be off, uh, going off to secondary school, and for the first time in his life, he wouldn't be with Dudley. Dudley had been accepted to Uncle Vernon's old private school, Smeltings. Piers Polkis was going there too. Harry, on the other hand, was going to Stonewall High, the public school. The local public school. Dudley thought this was very funny. They stuff people's heads down the toilet the first day at Stonewall, he told Harry. Want to come upstairs and practice? No, thanks, said Harry. The poor... The poor toilets never had anything as horrible as your head down it. It might be sick. Then he ran before Dudley could work out what he'd said. On the uh, one day in July, July fast approaching, can you believe it? One day in July, Aunt Petunia took Dudley to London to buy him his smelting uniform, leaving Harry at Mrs. Fig's. Mrs. Fig wasn't as bad as usual. It turned out she'd broken her leg tripping over one of her cats, and she didn't seem quite as fond of them as before. She let Harry watch television and give him a bit of, gave him a bit of chocolate, a bit of chocolate cake that tasted as though she'd had it for several years. I've had chocolate cake go bad in my fridge before. It is not a pretty thing. Readers, notes there. <laughs> That evening, and it doesn't take several years for that matter, so anyway, that evening Dudley paraded around the living room for the family in his new uniform, brand new, Smelting's Boy uniform, uh, maroon, uh, Smelting's Boys uh, wore maroon tailcoats, orange knickerbockers, and flat straw hats called boaters. They also carried knobbly sticks, used for hitting each other while the teachers weren't looking. This was supposed to be good training for later in life. As he looked at Dudley to his new knicker boxes, uh, in his new knicker uh, Uncle Vernon said gruffly that it was the proudest moment of his life. Aunt Petunia burst, burst into tears and said she couldn't believe it was her ickle Dudleykins. He looked so handsome and grown up. Harry didn't trust himself to speak. He thought two of his ribs might already have cracked from trying not to laugh. There was a horrible smell in the kitchen uh, the next morning when Harry went in for breakfast. It seemed to be coming from a large metal tub in the sink. He went to have a look. The tub was full of what looked like dirty rags swimming in grey water. What's this? Uh, sorry, that's supposed to be Harry, not Aunt Petunia. What's this? He asked Aunt Petunia. Her lips tightened as they always did if he dared to ask a question. Your new, your new uniform! she said. Harry looked in the bowl again. Oh, he said. I didn't realize it had to be so wet. Don't be stupid, snapped, uh, snapped Aunt Petunia. I'm dyeing some of Dudley's old things gray for you. It took just like everyone else's when I finished. Harry seriously doubted this, but he thought it best not to argue. He sat down at the table and tried not to think about how he was going to look on his first day at Stonewall, Stonewall High like he was wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Dudley and Uncle Vernon came in both with wrinkled noses because of the smell from Harry's new uniform. Uncle Vernon opened his newspaper, as usual, and Dudley banged his smeltings stick, which he carried everywhere on the table. They heard the stick of the... Uh, they heard the slick... Bah! Bah! Sorry about that. They heard the click of the mail slot and flop of letters on the doormat. Get the mail, Dudley, said Uncle Vernon from behind his paper. Make Harry get it. Get the mail, Harry. Make Dudley get it. Poke him with your smelting stick, Dudley. Harry dodged the smelting stick and went to get the mail. 
Three things lay on the doormat. A postcard from Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, who was vacationing on the Isle of Wight, a brown envelope that looked like a bill, and a letter for Harry. Harry picked it up and stared at it, his heart twanging like a giant elastic band. No one ever in his whole life had written to him. Who would? He had no friends, no other relatives. He didn't belong to the library, so he'd never even gotten rude notes asking for books back. Yet here it was, a letter addressed so plainly there could be no mistake. Mr. H. Potter. The cupboard under the stairs for Privet Drive, Little Winging, Surrey. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. There was no stub. Turning the envelope over, his hand trembled. Harry saw purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. Hurry up, boy! shouted Uncle Vernon from the kitchen. What are you doing? Checking the letter bomb? Checking for letter bombs? He chuckled at his own joke. Harry went back to the kitchen, still staring at his letter. He handed Uncle Vernon the bill and the postcard, sat down, and slowly began to open the yellow envelope. Uncle Vernon ripped open the bill, snorted in disgust, and flipped over the postcard. Marge is ill, he informed Aunt Petunia. Ain't a funny well. Dad, said Dudley suddenly, Dad, Harry's got something. Harry was on the point of unfolding his letter, which was written on the same heavy parchment as the envelope, when it was jerked sharply out of his hand by Uncle Vernon. That's mine, said Harry, trying to snatch it back. He'd be writing to you, sneered Uncle Vernon, shaking the letter upon uh, open with one hand and glancing at it. His faint face went from red to green faster than a set of traffic lights. And it didn't stop there. Within seconds, it was the grayish-white of old porridge. Petunia! He gasped. Dudley tried to grab the letter to read it, but Uncle Vernon held it high out of his reach. Aunt Petunia took it curiously and read the first line. For a moment, it looked as though she might faint. She clutched her throat and made a choking noise. Vernon! Oh, my goodness! Vernon! They stared at each other, seeming to have forgotten that Harry and Dudley were still in the room. Dudley wasn't used to being ignored. He gave his father a sharp tap on the head with his smelting stick. I want to read that letter, he said loudly. I want to read it, said Harry furiously, as it's mine. Get out, both of you! Crooked, uh, croaked Uncle Vernon, stuffing the letter back into its envelope. Harry didn't move. I want my letter! He shouted. Let me see it, demanded Dudley. Out, roared Uncle Vernon, and he took both Harry and Dudley by the scruffs of their necks and threw them into the hall, slamming the kitchen door behind them. Harry and Dudley promptly had a furious but silent fight over who would listen at the keyhole. Dudley won, so Harry, his glasses dangling from one ear, lay flat on his stomach to listen at the crack between the door and the floor. Vernon, Aunt Petunia said, uh, was saying in a quivering voice, look at the address. That was, oh, that sounded like a Dracula thing, sorry. Look at the address. But, uh, how could they possibly know where he sleeps? You don't think they're watching the house? Watching, spying, might be following us, muttered Uncle Vernon wildly. But what should we do, Vernon? Should we write back, tell them we don't want... Harry could see Uncle Vernon's shiny black shoes pacing up and down the kitchen. No, he said finally. No, we'll ignore it. If they don't get an answer, yes, that's best. We won't do anything. But I'm not having one in the house, Petunia. Didn't we swear when we took him in we'd stamp out that dangerous nonsense? The evening when he got back from work, Uncle Vernon did something he'd never done before. He visited Harry in his cupboard. "'Where's my letter?' said Harry, the moment Uncle Vernon had squeezed through the door. "'Who's writing to me?' "'No one. It was addressed to you by mistake,' said Uncle Vernon shortly. "'I have burned it.' "'It was not a mistake,' said Harry angrily. "'I had it in—it uh, it had my cupboard on it.' "'Silence!' yelled Uncle Vernon, and a couple of spiders fell from the ceiling. He took a few step, a deep breaths and then forced his face into a smile, which looked 
quite painful. Uh, yes, Harry, about this cupboard. Your aunt and I have been thinking you're really getting a bit big for it. We think it might be nice if you moved into Dudley's second bedroom. Why? said Harry. Don't ask questions, snapped the uncle. Take this stuff upstairs now. The Dursley's house had four bedrooms, one for Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia, one for visitors, usually Uncle Vernon's sister Marge, one where Dudley slept, and where, one where Dudley kept all the toys and things that wouldn't fit in his first bedroom. It only took Harry one trip upstairs to move everything he owned from the cupboard to his bedroom. Or to his room. He sat down on the bed and stared around him. Nearly everything in here was broken. The month-old video camera was lying on top of a small working tank Dudley had once driven over the next-door neighbor's dog. In the corner was Dudley's first-ever television set, which he'd put his thro foot through when his favorite program had been cancelled. There was a large birdcage, which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which was up on a shelf with the end of the be <laughs> with the end of all bent beak let me start that sentence again which he had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle which was up on a shelf with the end all bent because Dudley had sat on it other shelves were full of books they were the only things in the room that looked as though they'd never been touched from downstairs came the sound of Dudley bawling at his mother i don't want him in there i need that room make him get out Harry sighed and stretched out on the bed. Yesterday he'd have given anything to be up here. Today he'd rather be back in his cupboard with that letter than up here without it. Next morning at breakfast everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick, been, uh, been sick on purpose, kicked his mother, and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof, and he still didn't have his room back. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday, was thinking about this time yesterday, and bitterly wished he'd opened the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the mail arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom for Privet Drive! With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting in which everyone got hit by the smelting stick, Uncle, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard. I mean, your, your bedroom. He wheezed at Harry. Dudley, uh, g just go. Harry walked round and round his new room. Someone knew he had moved uh, out of the cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again? Surely that meant they'd try again? And this time he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. They repair, uh, the, the repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off. He quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Pri Privet Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall toward the front door. Ah! Harry leapt into the air. He'd trodden on something big and squashy at the doormat, suddenly alive. Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized that the big squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the front of the f uh, foot of the front door in a sleeping bag, clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour, and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the mail had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. I hear the neighbors. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the mail slot. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails, if they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon, 
Oh, these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruitcake Aunt Petunia had just bought him, uh, brought him. <laughs> On Friday, no less than twelve letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the mail slot, they had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and even forced through the small window in the, in the downstairs bathroom. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could get out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. Now, at this moment, dear readers, I will take a small interlude so that I can uh, sing a little bit of tiptoe through the tulips to you in the style and fashion of uh, oh, 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 Tiny Tim, if you've never heard the song. Tiptoe through the tulips. Ooh, da, da, na, 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 na. I don't remember all of the words. And that was a short interlude for your viewing pleasure and experience. Now, back to the story. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. Twenty-four letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up, and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that the very confused mailman had fin uh, handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window, while Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food processor. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Sorry, that wasn't supposed to be Uncle Vernon, that was supposed to be Dudley. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table, looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them cheerfully as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. No damn letters today. Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him sharply on the back of the head. Next moment, thirty or forty letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursleys ducked, but Harry, kept, Harry leapt into the air, trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had run out with their arms all over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. There uh, they could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floor. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts out of his moustache at the same time. I want you all back in here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his moustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, and they watched their way through. Uh, they wrenched their way through the boarded up doors and were in the car speeding toward the highway dudley was sniffling in the back seat his father had hit him around uh, hit him round the head for holding them up while he tried to pack his television vcr and computer in his sports bag they drove and they drove even Aunt petunia didn't dare ask where they were going every now and then uncle vernon would take a sharp turn and drive in the opposite direction for a while <laughs> Shake him off, shake him off, he would mutter whenever he did this. They didn't stop to eat or drink all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he wanted to see, and he'd never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. Uncle Vernon stopped at last outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars, and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold tinned tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. "'Excuse me, but as one of you, Mr. H. Potter, only got about a hundred of these from under the front desk.' She held up a letter. Oh, that was a female voice. My bad, everyone. But anyway, she held up a letter so they could read the green ink. Mr. H. Potter, Room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. 
Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly hours later, but Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. Oh, oh, yes. He drove them into the middle of a forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back in the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a ploughed field, halfway across a suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-level parking garage. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully later that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. <laughs> it started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley snivelled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. It, it was Monday, and he could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television. Then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's eleventh birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dursleys uh, had given him a coat hanger with a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't eleven every day. Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package, and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everyone, out! It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out at sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was certain, there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight, said Uncle Vernon gleefully, clapping his hands together, and this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin at an old rowboat bobbing in the iron-grey water below them. "'I've already got us some rations,' said Uncle Vernon, "'so all aboard!' It was freezing in the boat. Icy sea spray and rain crept down their necks, uh, and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock, where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken-down house. No, I'm not leaving the page, darn it. I'm reading to people. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed. The wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls, and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's and rations turned out to be a bag of chips each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty chip bag was smoked and shriveled up. Just smoked and shriveled up. Oh, could do with some of those letters now, eh? he said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver mail. Had he privately agreed, though the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, he promised uh, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high water splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy shadow windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moulded blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and to curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned, around, uh, turned over, trying to get comfortable, his stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's, Dudley's snores were drowned by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the edge of the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd been eleven. He'd be eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondered, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all, wondering where the letter writer was now. Five minutes to go. Harry heard something creak outside. He hoped the roof wasn't going to fall in, although he might be warmer if it did four minutes to go. Maybe the house in Privet Drive would be so full of letters when they got back that he'd be able to steal one somehow. Three minutes to go. Was a sea slapping hard on the rock like that? And two minutes to go. What was that funny crunching noise? 
was the rock crumbling in the, into the sea. One minute to go, and he'd be eleven. Thirty seconds. Twenty. Ten. Nine. Maybe he'd wake Dudley up just to annoy him. Three. Two. One. A boom! Ah, I like that, didn't you? The whole shack shivered, and Harry sat bolt upright, staring at the door. Someone was outside, knocking to come in. And that is the end of chapter three. And now we move on to chapter four. This one is called The Keeper of the Keys. Now, I do hope you all have been keeping up with the reading, as I see there are some who are still here, and I'm hoping more will show up. Uh, just before I start this, make sure you share this reading with your friends, share it on your Facebook page, that way others know it's here. And don't forget that it is also on YouTube. I will be posting that link as soon as we are done here tonight. Uh, it will be uh, loaded and shared on YouTube, and I will share that link on my personal Facebook page as well. So if you're watching only for a few minutes and you would like to hear the whole thing later, you can wait for that link and listen later. And uh, if you do, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube page. That way you get uh, notifications every time one of these videos is put up. Anyway, that was a good little excuse of time for me to go ahead and send some invites. Now we move on to chapter four. Keeper of the Keys. Boom! Ba-boom! They knocked again. Dudley jerked awake. Where's the ca Where's the cannon? He, he said stupidly. There was a crash behind them, and Uncle Vernon came skidding into the room. He was holding a rifle in his hands. Now they knew what had been in the long, thin package he had brought with them. Who's there? He shouted. I warn you, I'm armed. There was a pause. Then, smash! The door was hit with such force that it swung clean off its hinges and with a deafening crash landed flat on the floor. A giant of a man was standing in the doorway. His face was almost completely hidden in a long, shaggy mane of hair and a wild, tangled beard, but you could make out his eyes glinting like black beetles under all the hair. The giant squeezed his way into the hut, stooping so that his head just brushed the ceiling. Yes, stooping. He bent down, picked up the door, and fitted it easily back into its frame. The noise of the storm outside dropped a little. He turned to look at them all. Couldn't wake you up. Uh, couldn't make us a cup of tea, could you? It's not been an easy journey. He strode over to the uh, sofa where Dudley sat frozen with fear. Budge up, you great lump, said the stranger. Dudley squeaked and ran to hide behind his mother, who was crouching, terrified, behind Uncle Vernon. And here's Harry, said the giant. Harry looked up into the fierce, wild, shadowy face and saw that the beetle eyes were crinkled in a smile. Last time I saw you, you was only a baby, said the giant. Yeah, you look a lot like your dad, but you've got your mom's eyes. Uncle Vernon made a funny, rasping noise. Little man, did you leave us at once, sir, he said. You are breaking and entering. Now shut up, Desley, you great prune, said the giant. He reached over, in the bl uh, over the black of the sofa, jerked the gun out of Uncle Vernon's hands, bent it into a knot as easily if it had been made of rubber, and threw it into a corner of the room. Uncle Vernon made another funny noise, like a mouse being trodden on. Anyway, Harry, said the giant, turning his back on the Dursleys. A very happy birthday to you. Got summit for you here. I might have sat on it at some point, but it'll taste all right. From an inside pocket of his black overcoat, he pulled a slightly, just slightly squashed box. Had it opened it with trembling fingers. Inside was a large, sticky chocolate cake with Happy Birthday Harry, written on it in green icing. Harry looked up at the giant. He meant to say thank you, but the words got lost on the way to his mouth, and what he said instead was, Who are you? The giant chuckled. True, I haven't introduced myself. Rubius Haggard, uh, Hagrid, keeper of the keys and grounds at Hogwarts. He held out an enormous hand and shook Harry's whole arm. What about, what about that tea then, eh? He said, rubbing his hands together. I'd not st uh, say uh, no to something stronger if you got it, mind. 
His eyes fell on the empty gate with the shriveled chip bags in it, and he snorted. He bent down over the fireplace. They couldn't see what he was doing, but when he drew back a second later, there was a roaring fire. It filled the whole damp hut with flittering light, and Harry felt the warmth wash over him as though he'd sunk into a hot bath. The giant sat back down on the sofa, which sagged under his weight, and began talking all sorts of things out, uh, taking all sorts of things out of the pockets of his coat. A copper kettle, a squishy package of sausages, a poker, a teapot, several chipped mugs, and a bottle of some amber liquid that he took a swig from before starting to make tea. Soon the hut was full of the sound and smell of sizzling sausage. Nobody said a thing while the giant was working, but as he slid the first six fat, juicy, slightly burnt sausages from the poker, Dudley fidgeted a little. Uncle Vernon said sharply, Don't touch anything he gives you, Dudley. The giant chuckled darkly. Yes, hello, everyone. I see everyone who has joined. Glad to have all of you. Uh, and I'm glad you're, you're here enjoying the reading. All right, I will give you individual hellos later on, but in the meantime, glad you're here. Continuing on now. Your great pudding of a son don't need fattening anymore, Dursley. Don't worry. He passed the sausages, sausages to Harry, who was so hungry he had never tasted anything so wonderful, but he still couldn't take his eyes off the giant. Finally, as somebody seemed about to explain anything, uh, as nobody seemed about to explain anything, he said, I'm sorry, but I still don't really know who you are. The giant took a gulp of tea and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Call me Agrid, he said. Everyone does, and like I told you, I'm the keeper of the keys at Hogwarts. Y you'll know all about Hogwarts, of course. Sausages indeed. <laughs> uh, no, said Harry. Hagrid looked shocked. Sorry, said Harry quickly. Sorry? barked Hagrid, turning to stare at the Dursleys, who shrank back into the shadows. It's them as should be sorry. I, kn oh, I knew you weren't getting your letters, but I never thought you, you you wouldn't even know about Hogwarts. For crying out loud, did you never wonder where your parents learned it all? What? said Harry. Oh, what? Hagrid thundered. Now, wait just one second. He had leapt up to his feet. In his anger, he seemed to fill the whole hut. The Dursleys were cowering against the wall. Do you mean to tell me, he growled at the Dursleys, that this boy, this boy knows nothing about anything? Harry thought this was going a bit far. He had been to school, after all, and his marks weren't bad. I know some things, he said. I can, you know, do math and stuff. But Hagrid simply waved his hand and said, About our world, I mean your world, my world, your parents' world. What world? Hagrid looked as if he was about to explode. Dursley, he boomed. Uncle Vernon, who had gone very pale, whispered something that sounded like, Wimble, Wimble. Hagrid stared wildly at Harry. But you must know about your mum and dad, he said. I mean, they're famous. You're famous. What? What? My mum and dad weren't famous, were they? You don't know. You don't know. Hagrid ran his finger through his hair, fixing Harry with a bewildered stare. You don't know what you are, he said finally. Uncle Vernon suddenly found his voice. Stop, he commanded. Stop right there, sir. I forbid you to tell the boy anything. A braver man than uh, Vernon Dursley would have quailed under the furious look Hagrid now gave him. When Hagrid spoke, his every syllable trembled with rage. You never told him, never told him what was in the letter Dumbledore left for him. I was there. I saw Dumbledore leave it, Dursley, and you've kept it from him all these years. Kept what from me? said Harry eagerly. Stop, I forbid you, yelled Uncle Vernon in panic. Aunt Petunia gave a gasp of horror. I'll go boil your heads, both of you, said Hagrid. Harry, you're a wizard. There was a silence inside the hut. Only the sea and the whistling wind could be heard. I'm a what? gasped Harry. A wizard, of course, said Hagrid, sitting back down on the sofa, which groaned and sank even lower. And a thumping good'un, I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit, with a mum and dad like yours, what else would you be? And I reckon it's about time you read your letter. Harry reached out his hand to, uh, at last to take the yellowish envelope addressed in emerald green to Mr. H. Potter, the floor, hut on the rock, the sea. He pulled out the letter and read, 
Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Headmaster Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Sorcerer, Chief Warlock, Supreme Mugwump, International Confederation of Wizards. Dear Mr. Potter, we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment. Uh, by the way, if you'd rather let me know, if you'd rather, I could do the Dumbledore voice from the, um, the Potter Puppet Friends cartoon. In which case, I'd speak a bit more like this. <laughs> Dumbledore! Uh, so if you'd rather I do that voice, feel free to comment, and I, I may be willing to switch it up to that. That might hurt a little bit to do in extended periods of time, but I may be willing. In the meantime, I will continue on. Term begins on September 1st. We await your owl by no later than July 31st. Yours sincerely. Damn, that whole thing was by Minerva McGonagall, not Albus Stumbledore. Uh, yes, Minerva McGonagall, uh, Deputy Headmistress. So please imagine that for a minute Minerva McGonagall had a strep throat and that's why she was speaking like Dumbledore. Anyway, back on to the book. Questions exploded inside Harry's head like fireworks and he couldn't decide which to ask first. After a few minutes, he stammered, What does it mean? They wait my owl. Galloping Gorgons, that reminds me, said Hagrid clapping a hand to his forehead with enough force to knock over a cart horse. And from yet another pocket, inside his overcoat, he pulled an owl, a real, live, rather ruffled-looking owl, a long quill and a roll of parchment. With his tongue between his teeth, he scribbled a note that Harry could read upside down. Dear Professor Dumbledore, given Harry his letter, taking him to buy his things tomorrow. Weather's horrible. Hope you're okay. Hagrid. Hagrid rolled up the note, gave it to the owl, which clamped it in its beak, went to the door, and threw the owl out into the storm. Then he came back and sat down as though this was a normal, as normal as talking on the telephone. Harry realized his mouth was open and closed it quickly. Where am I? said Hagrid, but at that moment Uncle Vernon, still ashen faced but looking very angry, moved into the firelight. He's not going, he said. Hagrid grunted. I'd like to see a great mugger like you stop him, he said. A what? said Harry, interested. A muggle, said Hagrid. It's what we call no magic folk like them. And it's your bad luck you grew up in a family of the biggest muggles I ever laid eyes on. We swore, but, uh, swore when we took him in we'd put a stop to that rubbish, said Uncle Vernon. Swore we'd stamp it out of him. Wizard indeed. You knew, said Harry. You knew I'm a, a wizard. Knew, shrieked Aunt Petunia suddenly. Knew? Of course we knew. How could you not be? My dratted sister being what she was. Oh, she got a letter just like that and disappeared off to that, that school and came home every vacation with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rats. I was the only one who saw her for what she was, a freak. But for my mother and father, oh no, it was Lily this and Lily that. They were proud of having a witch in the family. She stopped to draw a breath and then went on ranting. Uh, went ranting on. It seemed she had been wanting to say this all for years. Then she met that porter at school and they left and got married and had you. And of course I knew you'd be just the same, just as strange, just as, as abnormal. And then, if you please, she went and got herself blown up and we got landed with you. Harry had gone very white. As soon as he found his voice, he said, Blown up? You told me they died in a car crash. Car crash! roared Hagrid, jumping up so angrily that the Dursleys scuttled back to their corner. How could a car crash kill Lily and James Potter? It's an outrage! A scandal! Harry Potter! Oh, not knowing his own, his own story when every kid in our world knows his name! But why? What happened? Harry asked urgently. The anger, f anger faded from Hagrid's face. He looked suddenly anxious. I never expected this. He said in a low, worried voice, I had no idea when Dumbledore told me there might be trouble getting hold of you. How much you didn't know. Oh, Harry, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to tell you. But someone's got to... You, you can't go off to Hogwarts not knowing. He threw a dirty look at the Dursleys. Well, it's best you know as much as I can tell you. Mind, I can't tell you everything, but it's a great mystery part of it. He sat down. 
stared into the fire for a few seconds and then said, it begins, I suppose, with uh, with a person called, uh, but it's incredible, you don't know his name, everyone in our world knows. Who? Well, I don't like saying a name if I can help it. No one does. Why not? Gulp and gargoyles, Harry, people are still scared. Blimey, this is difficult. See, there was this wizard who went bad, as bad as you could go. Worse, worse than worse. His name was... Hagrid gulped, but no words came out. Could you write it down? Harry suggested. No, can't spell it. All right. Voldemort. Hagrid shuddered. Don't make me say it again. Anyway, this... This wizard, about 20 years ago now, started looking for followers. Got him, too. Some were afraid, some just wanted a bit of his power, because, you know, he was getting himself power and all right. Dark days, Harry. Didn't know what to trust. Who to trust? Didn't get a dare get friendly with strange wizards or witches. Terrible things happened. He was taken over. Of course, some stood up to him, and he killed him. Horribly. One of the only safe places left was Hogwarts. Reckon Dumbledore's the only one you know who was afraid of. Didn't dare try taking the school, not just then anyway. Now, your mum and dad were as good a witch and wizard as I ever knew. Ed, boy and girl at Hogwarts in their day. Suppose the mystery of is, is, is why you know who never tried to get him on his side before. Probably knew they were too close to Dumbledore to want anything to do with the dark side. Maybe he thought he could persuade them. Maybe he just wanted them out of the way. All anyone knows is he turned up in the village where you was all living all uh, on Halloween ten years ago. You was just a kid. You was just a year old. He came to your house and... And... Hagrid suddenly pulled out a very dirty spotted handkerchief and blew his nose with a sound like a foghorn. Sorry, he said. But it's that sad, you know, knew your mum and dad and... Nice of people you couldn't find anywhere. You know who killed them. And then, and this is a real mystery of the thing, it tried to kill you. Wanted to make you, uh, make a clean job of it, I suppose. Or maybe he just didn't like, uh, he just liked killing by then. But he couldn't do it. Never wondered how you got that mark on your forehead. That was no ordinary cut. That's what you get when a powerful evil curse touches you. Take care of your mum and dad. And your house even, but it didn't work on you. And that's why you're famous, Harry. No one ever lived after he decided to kill him. No one except you. And he'd killed some of the best witches, witches and wizards of the age. The McKinnons, the Bones, the Pruitts. And he was the only baby. And you lived. Something very painful was going on in Harry's mind. As Hagrid's story came to a close, he saw again the blinding green flash of light more clearly than he had ever remembered it before, and he remembered something else for the first time in his life. A high, cold, cruel laugh. Hagrid was watching him sadly. Took you from the ruin house myself, on Dumbledore's orders. Brought you to this lot. Load of old tosh, said Uncle Vernon. Harry jumped. He had almost forget forgotten that the Dursleys were there. Uncle Vernon certainly seemed to have got back his courage. He was glaring at Hagrid, and his fists were clenched. Now you listen here, boy, he snarled. I accept there's something strange about you. Probably nothing a good beating wouldn't have cured. And as for all this about your parents, well, they were weirdos. No denying it, and the world's better off without them, in my opinion. As for all they got, getting mixed up with these wizarding types. Just what I expected. Always knew they'd come to a sticky end. But at that moment, Hagrid leapt from the sofa and drew a battered pink umbrella from inside his coat, pointing at Uncle Vernon like a sword. He said, I'm warning you, Dursley, I'm warning you, one more word. In danger of being speared on the end of the umbrella by a bearded giant, Uncle Vernon's courage failed again. He flat, uh, flattened himself against the wall and fell silent. That's better, said Hagrid, breathing heavily and sitting back down on the sofa, which this time sank right down to the floor. Harry, meanwhile, still had questions to ask, hundreds of them. But what happened to Vol- sorry, sorry, I mean, you know who? Good question, Harry. Disappeared. Vanished. Same night he tried to kill you. Makes you even more famous. That's the biggest mystery, see? He was getting more and more powerful. Why'd he go? Some say he died. Cod swallow, in my opinion. 
Don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Some say he's still out there, boiding his time, like, you know, but uh, I don't believe it. People who uh, who was on his side came back to ours. Some of them came out of kind of trances. Don't reckon they could have done. They could have done if he wasn't coming back. Most of them, uh, most of us reckon he's still out there somewhere, but lost his powers. Too weak to carry on. So, uh, cause something about you finished him out. Even the, there was something going on that night. He didn't count it on. Uh, he hadn't counted it on. I don't know what it was. No one does, but something about you stumped him. All right. Hagrid looked at Harry with warmth and respect blazing in his eyes, but Harry, instead of feeling pleased and proud, felt quite sure there had been a horrible mistake. A wizard. Him. How could he possibly be? He'd spent his life being clouted by Dudley and bullied by Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vern Vernon. If he was really a wizard, why hadn't he been turned into a warty toad every time? Uh, why hadn't they been turned into warty toads every time they tried to lock him in his cupboard? If he'd once defeated the great sorcerer in the world, how come Dudley was had always been able to kick him around like a football? Hagrid, he said quickly, I think you must have made a mistake. I don't think I can be a wizard. To his surprise, Hagrid chuckled. Not a wizard, eh? Never made things happen when you were scared or angry. Harry looked at the fire. Now he came to think about it. Every odd thing that had ever made his aunt and uncle furious with him uh, had happened when he, Harry, had been upset or angry. Chased by Dudley's gang, he had somehow found himself out of their reach. Dreading going to school with that ridiculous haircut, he'd managed to grow it all back. And the very last time Dudley had hit him, hadn't he got his revenge without even realizing he was doing it? Hadn't he set a bow constrictor on him? Harry looked back at Hagrid, smiling, and saw that Hagrid was positively beaming at him. See, said Hagrid, Harry Potter, not a wizard. You wait, you'll be famous at Hogwarts. But Uncle Vernon wasn't going to give in without a fight. Haven't I told you he's not going? he hissed. He's going to Stonewall High, and he'll be grateful for it. I've read these letters, and he needs all sorts of rubbish, spell books, and wands, and if he wants to go, a great mother like you won't stop him, growled Hagrid. Stop Lily and James Potter's son going to Hogwarts. <laughs> You're mad. His name's been down ever since he was born. He's off to the finest school of witchcraft and wizardry in the world. Seven years there, he won't know himself. He'll be with young sisters of his own sort for a change, uh, with youngsters of his own sort for a change, and he'll be under the greatest headmaster Hogwarts ever had, Albus Dumbledore. Oh, I am not paying for some crackpot old fool to teach him magic tricks, yelled Uncle Vernon, but he had finally gone too far. Hagrid seized his umbrella and whirled it over his head. Never, he thundered, insult Albus Dumbledore in front of me! He, he brought the umbrella swooshing down through the air to point at Dudley with a flash. There was a flash of violet light, a sound like a firecracker, a sharp squeal, and the next second Dudley was dancing on the spot with his hands clasped over his fat bottom, howling in pain. When he turned his back on them, Harry saw a curly pig's tail poking through a hole in his trousers. Uncle D Vernon roared. Uh, pulling on Petunia and Dudley into the other room, he cast one last terrified look at Hagrid and slammed the door behind them. Hagrid looked down at his umbrella and stroked his beard. Shouldn't have lost my temper, he said ruefully, but it didn't work anyway. Meant to turn him into a pig. But I suppose he was so much like a pig anyway there wasn't much left to do. He cast a sideways look at Harry under his bushy eyebrows. Be grateful if you didn't mention that to anyone at Hogwarts, he said. I'm not supposed to do magic, strictly speaking. I was allowed to do a bit to, you know, follow you and get your letters to, to you and stuff. Uh, one of the reasons I was so keen to take the job. Why aren't you supposed to do magic? Asked Harry. Oh, well, I was at Hogwarts myself, but I uh, got expelled, to tell the truth, in the third year. They snapped me, warned enough and everything, but Dumbledore let me stay on as gamekeeper. Great man, Dumbledore. Why were you expelled? It's getting late, and we've got lots to do tomorrow," said said Hagrid loudly. "Gotta keep up to uh, get up to town, get all your books and all in that." He took off his thick black coat and threw it to Harry. "You can keep under that," he said. "Don't mind if it wriggles a bit. I think it's still got a couple of door mice in one of the pockets." And with that, dear listeners, we are done with chapter four.
and Monday evening, we will move on to chapter 5. Don't forget, tomorrow and Sunday, we will be reading some Russian fairy tales. Uh, and we are not restricted to Russian fairy tales. If there are any fairy tales you would like read, go ahead and let me know, and I will add them to the list. But in the meantime, I have a full giant book of Russian fairy tales, and I would really like to read those to you. So I will be reading those on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Now, a quick hello to everyone who joined tonight, who had notified me of at least. I see Trisha. Hello, Trisha. Hello, Berkeley. Hello, Kim, Katie, uh, Mum, Kelsey, uh, Mr. McKean. Uh, oh, yes, you're one of my favorite professors of all time. Thanks for joining. Glad to see you here. Hello, Rafi. Hello, Shay, Donna, Katie. Uh, oh, Mrs. Coons, sorry. Uh, hello, Kayla. Hello, Bill, Joey, Laura. Uh, sorry, Laurie. And let's see, Ricky, A.D., Jean, Peter, and Brooke. Hello, everyone. All of my love to all of you who joined, all of you who have listened. And don't forget, I will be posting this on YouTube as well, where you can listen to the whole thing. You can also skip forward a bit if you like. You can skip past, well, this, this end bit, but there's nothing after this end bit. You can skip past the beginning bit uh, and uh, past the slight interlude in the middle. But why would you want to skip the, the musical interlude? Anyway. Thank you again. Love you all. Appreciate you. And don't forget to share the YouTube video once I have it posted so that other people know to watch. And don't forget to subscribe to my page as well. Until next time, I bid you adieu. Have yourself a wonderful, safe evening.